Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to Your Money Momentum Podcast. My name is Tom Kennedy and I'm with Kevin Curley. Kevin, what's going on? Just almost had a Marco Rubio moment there with you in the water bottle. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know what moment you're referring to. Oh, when he uh, was in the debate and got asked a question, took like, or was on broadcast, took like a seven or 10 second sip of water so he could think about his answer. But, it's a nice stall technique. Yeah, I, I, it works, right? All right. So let's, uh, we're going to talk about a topic today that comes up quite a bit, especially as of late with costs going up, but that is property and casualty. Uh, Homeowners, auto insurance, umbrellas, we'll talk about uh, where it's at, some strategies around it, uh, what you should be thinking and looking for, and then we'll end with some some role plays and have a, a fun couple topics uh, based on current events and what's in the news. So, well, let's start here. Costs have been going up like crazy. What are your thoughts there, Kevin? Yeah, the uh, Federal Reserve in one of the most recent reports said that one of the main sources of inflation over the past year has been the increased price in car insurance uh, up like 26% year over year. And I think that people have been receiving renewal letters where you see a huge spike in what it's costing them. So, you know, suddenly a need, something you have to pay for is costing you way more, kind of like what people were having at the grocery store and they're very frustrated. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why, primarily it's because of all the catastrophes and windstorms and, you know, storms like you experienced recently in Houston, uh, making a lot of damage. And so insurance companies have to raise rates and the other part of that is reinsurers that take some of their risk off the table. They have to raise their rates because of losses they're anticipating or have suffered. So everybody's getting hit. So we wanted to kind of run through the main three things that you need and uh, how to shop one. Yeah. You know, talking about cost too and inflation, I was looking at a, a chart that JP Morgan puts out. And when you look at uh, headline inflation, which in includes uh, food and energy, um, you know, we're at, you know, 3.4, 3.5%. Auto insurance alone makes up almost 0.8% uh, of that number. And when you strip out, they JP Morgan does something called core services X shelter. So when you strip out, um, energy, uh, cost of goods, and then shelter, it makes up almost 75% of the inflation number, just auto insurance alone. And to your point, I think it's because of a lot of the natural disasters that we've seen. I know a lot of insurers pulled out of Florida completely altogether. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the top three states that are most expensive for car insurance, uh, Texas is number three on there. So uh, I don't see that going down anytime soon, but let's talk about some, some strategies around it. Yeah. The first one is just to be sure to shop around. So if you've been with the same insurance company for eight or 10 years, they've lightly kind of boiled you like a frog, meaning they've raised your premium slowly every single year, but just enough that they're making a little bit more, but not enough for you to switch companies. So you likely have a situation where if you look back at what it was six years ago, your premiums may have doubled. And so the first thing to do is to shop around. So if you have State Farm, go see what Geico offers. Uh, you can hire an independent agent. They can shop a lot of markets that you can't access directly. You can go on Allstate's website, Progressive, all those different companies you see advertising for and put in your information and see if they have a better rate. Um, you know, some of them have guarantees of price match. Some of them say they'll beat other prices. Some, especially in the first year, might be 10 or 15% cheaper than what you have been paying. Um, so that would be the first spot is just to go shopping. Um, the second, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, that's a good point. I would definitely, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not working with an agent and yeah, you can go onto these sites yourselves, but you're not going to pay any more by going through an agent. It's like, you know, I tell you the, you know, uh, younger clients that are looking for apartments, get, Get, so, get a realtor. You're not going to pay them. The apartment building pays them and you're not going to get a cheaper price by going direct or going through an agent. And, you know, insurance companies, what they do is they 
they their actuaries say you're taking on too much risk. You have too many policy outstanding, so they they raise the cost. Because the question we get a lot is, well, why is you know Geico so much cheaper from my Allstate quote? And it's just it ebbs and flows. They they increase the fees based on how much risk that they're taking on, and then someone else comes into play that can get it at a lower cost, and then they go up, and it just you keep switching back and forth. So shopping it around, I think annually makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and they all kind of have different ways of doing it. So, for example, when I shopped mine last year, uh, had been with the same company for a while, uh, and they just price was out of control. Um, and so I ended up looking at another one and got a much better deal. And they had some features on if you're a safe driver, you get a discount. And so uh, there's a lot of things available to you that you might not realize. And it just kind of one of those things, shake the cobwebs off your old policy, get it reviewed by an agent, make sure that you're up to date on that. Um, the second strategy that I would say is to consider increasing your deductible. So this is going to be you taking on more risk. So if you have a home and you think it costs forty or fifty thousand dollars to replace the roof, uh, usually you'd have a one percent deductible on your homeowner's policy about that roof. Well, you might say, well, I'm going to basically have to pay for almost that my entire self. What if I did a one and a half or a two percent deductible? Or on your car insurance, you went from five hundred dollar deductible on collision to a thousand. You may end up saving yourself a lot of money uh, on the monthly premiums and only cost yourself $500 if you get an accident. And if you're a safe driver and usually don't have it, or you don't anticipate getting in multiple accidents, that could be some easy savings as well. Yeah. It, and another thing to piggyback off that too, you know, some insurance policies will cover, cover windshields. And in Texas, yeah, right. as you know, um, you get a lot of cracks in your windshield. Do not run that through your insurance company because the more claims you run, the higher your premium is going to go up. And, you know, you can run it through, but more times than not, it makes more sense usually just to pay out of pocket because it's going to save you in the long end on the insurance cost because they're going to increase your, your premium. It could be something as small as just a cracked windshield that you that you filed. So you got to be cognizant too of when you file claims and you know where that. There's no, it's not black or white. There's no you know set form formula on when you should file versus when you should pay pay out of pocket. But uh, if you have an agent that you're working with, that can also be be helpful to run by them and see how that would affect your policy. Yeah. And that's another reason to shop around is some companies, they don't count that as a claim and they'll just let you replace that windshield all the time. And others would count it as a claim. So you right. do that two or three times over a few years. Suddenly it looks like you're a terrible driver, but really you just had a piece of hail or a piece of rock or something hit you. And now you got this windshield. Well, companies will look at that differently. So some would raise your rates and some would say, oh no, we cover windshields. That stuff happens all the time. We just kind of had that as an added benefit to our policy. Um, the, the kind of the next thing I would say is uh, looking at changing the limits uh, of your policy. So primary insurance limits are pretty expensive. So let's say you get a half a million dollars or a million dollars of liability coverage. Um, that can be kind of pricey if you try to raise that to, say, two million dollars. Uh, alternatively, you can buy what's called an umbrella policy. That one's going to provide excess liability over your primary insurance coverage. So let's say on your home you have a million dollars of coverage or you have half a million dollars of coverage on your car for if you get an accident and held liable. Well, that policy for an umbrella would sit over that and extend your limits a million, two million, three million dollars. And typically these policies only cost a few hundred dollars compared with your car insurance might cost a couple thousand dollars. So increasing those primary limits would be really expensive. But instead, lowering those and just having an umbrella policy sit over them can be a much cheaper way to get additional liability coverage. Yeah, and I'd recommend bundling everything. That's where you get the biggest discounts. And that's pretty, that's a blanket statement because it's pretty much true for all insurance companies. So the more mm -hmm. lines you have open with them, the more discounts you're going to get bundling it. You can add riders to these policies like jewelry and other items. So the more you can add to these insurance contracts and these riders, um, the better the pricing is. And again, you can shop it around and insurance companies like taking bundle deals because they have more diversifies it for them and they have more, more revenue streams from one, one customer. That's right. And then the last piece is just dropping certain coverages. So there was an article in the Wall Street Journal recently about people complaining about the price of car insurance. And the answer was, well, what if you just dropped collision and only carry liability? Uh, now, this obviously is very important because now you're self-insuring any damage that happens to the car if you get into an accident. So dropping that coverage could save you a lot of money. And if you owe, if you own like a real old car, it's only worth a few thousand dollars and it'd likely be totaled in an accident or you just replace it anyway because it's 15, 20 years old. Uh, that can make a lot of sense. But if you have a newer car and it's, you know, 40, 50, $60,000 of value that you're destroying, 
you know, what's that old phrase? Don't be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, being yeah, careful yeah. working with an agent to make sure your review dropping any coverages is important too. But let me ask you a question. I don't know the answer yeah. to this. I think I do. But if you finance the car or lease the car, you're, I think you have to have um, coverage on that vehicle, correct? Usually if you have a bank or you have a lease on there, they tell right. you exactly what kind of limits you have to carry from a deductible to the type of coverage, including, you know, collision, uh, et cetera. So right. you got to remember if you finance or lease the car, it's not your car yet. You don't have the title. It's, it's not yours. It's somebody else's. Right. And so you're just happen to be driving it, taking care of it. Uh, but you have to follow what the owner, uh, the bank or the leasing company uh, says you have to do. No, but it's a good point. If you have a beater or you're, if, you have, if you have a pass me down that you gave to your children, that if it were to total, it would only be, you know, maybe 5,000 you'd get back for it. Then it probably doesn't make sense to have the, the liability coverage on it or the collision coverage. Yeah. The last thing I'd say is uh, to, talking about teenage children or maybe ones that are in their twenties, uh, having them on a separate policy. So let's say you use one of the high end carriers, like a Chubb for your primary home coverage, as well as for your cars that are nice, but you gave the kid a Jeep and it's worth $12,000. It could make a lot of sense to go to Geico or one of those other mass carriers uh, for their coverage. Cause otherwise those rates for your, you know, your son or daughter to be on your car, coverage uh, could increase your premium significantly. So get them their own coverage separate, maybe even consider making them pay for it, uh, teaching that responsibility early on because they're going to hit stuff. That's just kind of <laughs> a rite of passage. Yeah, no, that's a good point is to, is to separate it because you do, if you go to those kind of higher end carriers like Chubb or Pure or Cincinnati um, because you have a higher priced home or you just have more policies, um, sometimes it's cheap just to go to Progressive or Geico for just a one-off type of, type of deal like your like your children's car. Yep. All right, good. Well, that's P&C Insurance. Uh, if you need a recommendation for an agent to work with, uh, Tom and I know a ton and we can help guide you in the right direction. Yeah, and I would just reiterate on that. I mean, it really doesn't cost anything to to work with an agent. They get paid by by the insurance companies, and, and the insurance companies aren't going to say, "Oh, well, we're paying an agent, so we're going to increase the cost of your insurance." Um, it's kind of one of those things that's just baked in, and most people don't know that. So, and I would also, when looking at an agent, look for one that's independent. Don't look for one that just works for Allstate or is a proprietary agent for one company because they can be agnostic and just truly shop out. Uh, the lowest rate for you. Yeah. You want somebody who has all the tools in the toolbox, not just one. Correct. All right. So let's, uh, let's do some role playing. All right, Kevin, you are Alex Rodriguez. You're in a legal battle over an NBA team, Minnesota T wolves and, uh, your new breakout star, Anthony Edwards. It seems the current owner had a change of heart or your financing fell through. What's going on? Are you buying the team or not? Oh, we're definitely buying the team. Uh, we've bought other teams in the past. I have a great partnership. Uh, we're going to be buying this team. This is just a simple owner having seller's remorse, not buyer's remorse. They can't get it together because now they see, oh, wait, our team is good for the first time in 20 years, and he's not ready to let it go. But uh, we're going to take this to court. Uh, I know that Carlisle wasn't able to come up with our financing on time, but we have tons of people who are willing to finance this deal. Teams like this, they only go up in value. So everybody, we're, we're going to have no problem with our financing. We missed, you know, one deadline. What, what's the big deal? There's nothing wrong here. We're, we're, we're good. We're buying the team. Well, based on your track record, I'm a little worried, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We're not going to strike out on this deal, Tom. <laughs> Ba-boom. All right. Uh, so, Tom, you're Ray Dalio. You just spent $19 million on two Singapore shop houses. Uh, first of all, what's a Singapore shop house? And second, why do you and your family office need one or two Singapore shop houses? What, what is this? Well, well, first off, uh, it was actually $28 million, Kevin. Um, and that that's 20... That's foreign money. And we got to convert it to dollars, Tom. That, that, that $28 million is not even a rounding error. I mean, $150 billion with the B that I manage for, for our clients. There's a, there's a lot of opportunity right now in the family office space, which is ultra high net worth individuals that want more than just investment management. They want to manage money for generations. They have properties, they have businesses. And uh, Singapore right now, 60% of 
all family offices in the Asia Pacific market are, are in Singapore. And the shop houses are nothing more than they started back in, in the 1800s by the Chinese immigrants. And it was basically a place where you could run your business and also, and also live. So they've, uh, there's been conservations in place. Um, we can write this off as part business up to 60%. And, uh, we can also have individuals reside there as well. So we think we're expanding our network. We're expanding our clients. We have a ton of clients overseas and this is just the natural progression. There's a ton of money in Singapore. Um, we don't see that going down anytime soon. And there's also other, uh, areas overseas that we've been looking at and trying to set up shops. So we think having boots on the ground makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we're not, there's no tax evasion going on that at least that I know of. And, uh, yeah, that's basically what a single sing house Singapore shop house is. I think that, uh, I'm picturing this retail shop with like a little crappy apartment building on top, but I suspect for 20 million or $28 million, it's a little nicer than what I'm picturing. Yeah, the there's it, it's a little bit nicer than that. If you've seen our office in New York, uh, it's gonna we're gonna replicate that, and we're gonna go to Dubai and the rest of the markets. Oh, nice! All right, <laughs> all right, uh, Kevin, you are Howard Marks. Your firm, Oak Tree Capital, took over Inter Milan after a Chinese owner can't restructure their debt. Uh, this is a fun new asset for your firm. Is this a sign of things to come? Uh, what can the fans of the top teams expect from Oak Tree Capital's ownership's tenure? Well, Tom, we just won the Serie A, uh, so that's pretty exciting. We're going go to the Champions League and hopefully win that as well. But, you know, I, I, I was Howard Marks a year ago, and what I told you was private credit is a great deal. What we're doing here is we're lending at teenage rates, so 12 13%. And if you miss a payment like this firm did from China, uh, we get the whole company. It just so happens that instead of a company, this time we get Inter Milan. And we're not just going to turn around and sell it. I mean, they were trying to shop, but they couldn't find a buyer to take out the debt and take over the company. So I think that, you know, sports teams are a great place to uh, clearly be lending. I mean, we just got this for a song. I, I feel like we're going to be able to make a quick double on how much we paid. And we, we tried to work with our partners. Uh, you know, a few years ago, that entire nation and the government was very supportive of sports. They were trying to do kind of, what, you know, the Middle Eastern countries have done of sports washing and buying, you know, different leagues. And, you know, it didn't work out for them. But, you know, when you take on debt and you miss payments, uh, the asset becomes the creditors. And, you know, this is just a great lesson for everybody considering private credit, whether it's 9% or 13%. Uh, it's a great deal. Look at this wonderful asset. And we got paid a little bit along the way. But they missed the payment and we get the whole company. Now we get to own this cool thing. I might be up in a suite. You see me. Wait. I'm not even that big of a sports fan, but this is going to be fun. I now own the best team in Milan in Italy uh, and maybe even all of Europe. So uh, we're excited. We've got a great head of Europe over there taking care of it. We might do two or three more of these teams. Wow. Well, I heard Aston Martin's for sale in Formula One. I'm surprised you guys haven't haven't looked into into that yet. Well, we don't we don't buy assets. We we lend to uh, mm. other people, and then if they happen to miss payments because the, the they can't afford the rates anymore, that's not our responsibility. They should have been more thoughtful about you know how much they borrowed. And, Good. You know, so you guys are just payments, vultures. That's not mine. Fantastic. No, we're 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 lending uh, at a fair price <laughs> to market participants that are well informed. <laughs> All right, Tom, you're Ed Yardeni, uh, somewhat famous economist. Uh, in a recent market insights column for the FT, you said the yield curve invasion, uh, yield curve inversion was no longer a reliable indicator and that most economists have been wrong just using that as their one thing uh, and that tight monetary policy has been offset by stimulative policy, baby boomers spending. Uh, are you sure you want to stake your reputation that there's not going to be a recession and this indicator that's right every single time is going to be wrong this time? What other proof do you have that this is not going to work just on a lag? You know, Kevin, you know what the secret is to a rain dance? <laughs> eventually, <laughs> eventually, eventually it's going to rain. Okay? okay. And if you look at the yield curve inversion and all the statistics behind it, yeah, it's predicted every recession since the early 60s. 
but the average amount of days it takes for the curve to go inverted is 589 days. We're actually at 566 days uh, from when the curve first went inverted back in October of 22. So we're pretty close to there. But if you look at the dispersion, it is all over the place. The longest period was was January of 66. It took 1,449 days for the curve to invert versus June of 73. It took 182 days uh, from the first inversion to go through a recession. So that to me isn't a very good predictor of a recession when you have that kind of delta uh, almost four years from the longest time to, to the shortest time. And one of the one of the reason why the curve goes inverted was well, a couple of reasons. First is the front end of the curve, which the Fed has direct control over, which raised rates quicker than anyone has ever see, seen before from zero to five and a half percent in 18 months. So naturally, the curve, the curve is going to go inverted. Um, so you can kind of almost say that this was in, this was kind of an anomaly. We've never seen the Fed raise rates that quickly. But the second reason a curve can go inverted is the, the middle or to the back end going down. And that tends to follow growth, tends to follow inflation expectations. And if you have an inverted curve, more times than not, it's because the back end is coming down, which is showing cracks of the economy. Um, but the back end of the curve hasn't really gone down. It's more. It's been more of the front end of the curve has been lifted so much so quickly. So no, I don't think it's it's going to, we're going to go into a recession anytime soon. And if we do, I don't think it has anything to do with the yield curve. It's just eventually we do go through these recessions. You have these business cycles that last for seven to nine years on average. So you're going to have another recession soon. And everyone's going to point back and say, well, see, I told you the curve went inverted 800 days ago. So I think there's almost very there's very little to no correlation in my opinion of the yield curve curve going inverted signaling a recession. I think it's the back end of the curve dropping, which is signaling uh, higher inflation and, and, and lower growth. So you're saying that uh, correlation does not equal causation. Economics 101. If if your professor <laughs> wrote that in big letters like mine did on the board, that was the first thing you learned. That's good. We'll keep an eye out. Keep I would like out. to know what the timeline is to be like, it's right, it's wrong for a yield curve inversion. Because we have seen it's gone like 730 days or I think there was one that was like 900 days later. It's like, yeah, it does happen. But well, you know, no, you I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at clock, a, right? looking at a chart that Bespoke put out. And all joking aside, uh, 66, it took 1,449 days uh, from when it happened. first word inverted. And then it <laughs> happened. And then again, it, it, June of 73, 182 days. So to me, there's no, it's not, it's not a tight amount of time and it's all over the place. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll do one more, Kevin. Uh, you are Amy Emerson, CEO of Lycos, and you are trying to get the FDA to allow MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD. There is also an increase in the use of ketamine to treat depression along with therapy. What is going on with pharma? Are recreational drugs suddenly a cure for ailments? Well, Tom, we had a minor setback yesterday when the FDA told us no, but we're going to appeal it and we're going to end up getting this. We have great investors like Stephen Cohen of SAC Capital, and he also owns the Mets. He's he's going to help us get this through the FDA and make this happen. But really, it's it's not a complicated story. It's if you look at what happened with Purdue Pharmaceutical and you look at what happened with all those opium settlement cases and all the things that they did were terrible, people don't trust pharma anymore. And then you think about some of the things that went on in COVID about things working and not working and quick approvals. Uh, people are looking outside the traditional synthetic solutions for their pain or for their trouble. So using MDMA for PTSD is you know one of the things we've studied and seen a really successful amount. Uh, sure, there's always side effects and some people who don't work out, but we've heard about the studies using ketamine and it's been very effective at treating depression. It helps people stop ruminating uh, which is a common problem. Now, there is a risk of sedation, disassociation, psychiatric events, or worsening of those disorders. Um, but I would say that that's the case for Xanax and Prozac and a lot of the other things they're using in traditional. Uh, the one that we haven't mentioned yet, but you know, people are using different types of psilocybin. Uh, so that's you know commonly known as mushrooms. So I think there's a re-exploration of using things that come from Mother Earth as opposed to from a lab and saying, I think that some of these solutions can be found without 
getting hooked on it and having some of the other nasty features that a lot of the painkillers had for the last decade or two. Yeah. Well, I don't know if MDMA comes from mother earth, but, uh, I, I agree with you on, on the mushrooms. In fact, there was a huge Netflix docu-series on all the different drugs that you just mentioned and the, the uh, alleged health benefits and, and effects on, on PTSD. And hey, if the research is, is, is showing that it helps, then, then it helps. Um, question is, is you know, how, do you, how do you limit that from recreational use? You, know, you look at yeah, well, medical the, marijuana. They, yeah, in the article I, I went through, I mean, ketamine, for example, somebody they got it prescribed and had it home and they had a terrible experience because all they could think about was getting up and vacuuming and doing all those other things. And so the next time they did it, they did it through the IV at their doctor's office and had a much better experience. But uh, look, it shows promise. I mean, this is the same thing that regular pharmaceuticals go through. They go through clinical trials to see if it works. There's a certain number of things that are allowed, the side effects, I and mean, we see the commercials. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, but it's interesting that people are exploring, we'll call it alternative mess medicine options. Well, you know, it's funny to your point. I mean, you look at painkillers and the, the, I mean, the epidemic that that cost um, and is still causing and Xanax and probably other drugs that they haven't even got to yet. So um, it's interesting. We'll see what comes of it. Yep. Well, thanks, All Tom. Right. Enjoyed this. All right, Kevin. Well, we'll, uh, we'll come back in a couple of weeks with uh, a new planning topic and some more, some more articles to tackle. All right. Talk to you soon. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.